Chris Sewell here, baseball card collector, investor, dealer in that order. Welcome everyone, finally getting around here to question and answers part two. My apologies for the uh, delay, I was dealing with some stuff, but this was supposed to come out about three weeks ago, but finally getting it out here today. Uh, let's go ahead and check it out. First question was sent out by Walker, who wrote, why are these League Leader vintage cards so much cheaper than the individual cards? As you can see from this one, I got it for $8. It has three Hall of Famers on it. I think these cards are awesome, and and they seem, and it seems you can always be picked up for under twenty dollars. I appreciate the lack of interest in them, which allows me to pick them up for a steal in my mind. Yeah, I totally agree. This is this is one of the best vintage bargains you can find. Is League Leader cards from the the '60s, really? I guess the early '70s as well. But yeah, you can get big time Hall of Fame. I mean, look, you got three Hall of. This isn't just three Hall of Famers. This is three like first ballot no brainer Hall of Famers on one card. Uh, you Stremski, Robinson, and Al Kaline. I mean, all, all three of these guys. You know. Uh, there's probably something like 1,400 home runs represented here on this card. You got it for eight bucks. This is from 1968. It's a 55-year-old card of three Hall of Famers. Eight bucks. Yeah, I totally agree. This is a. Uh, this, if this was on a regular roller, this was going the uh, you know the vintage bargains uh, section at the end. Next one was sent up by Meme Maker, who wrote, "Will PSA ever lose its top tier status if grading uh, gets commoditized like the computers with Dell, HP, etc.? Then it shouldn't matter since it's all the same thing." So I get asked this question a lot. Whenever I try to like look to the future, like what, what's the landscape going to look like, I, I try to look to the past and look at trends. And unless there's like an obvious reason for the trend to stop, I just assume the trend is going to continue as it, as it usually does. And PSA has just been the industry leader for you know basically 30 years now. And, and for the most part, they've been the distant industry leader that entire time with, with maybe a few exceptions. But even today, I mean, I think PSA grades something like 70% of all cards in the hobby today. They're just so far ahead of the other companies. And I know some of the other companies are making like incremental gains here and there, but it, it's really, it's really, a, they're, they're still a distant number one. And I, don't, I just don't see any signs suggesting that that's going to change uh, anytime soon. So I would just sort of assume they're just going to maintain top tier status for, for a long time. I mean, their pop report, their set registry, they're, they're just so superior to the other companies uh, simply because they just have so much more data. You know, I, it's funny. I think if you were like starting all four companies today, like all four companies, PSA, Beckett, SGC, and CSG, entered the hobby today and you said go I, I don't think PSA would win I think at least one or two of the other companies would end up on top as I think they just provide better overall service than PSA but there's just so many collectors locked into PSA at this point you know like I said the set registry and the pop report go so far back that uh, I, I, I just don't see another company catching PSA anytime anytime soon uh, your uh, commoditized idea that's interesting I mean yeah I, I don't think that'll happen but that's an interesting thought for sure Drowning Lifeguards wrote, I'm a small-time collector who has inherited a big money card. I'm sending the card off for grading and then want to sell. What's the best route to take there? I assume a well-known auction house like Greg Morris or Probstein would fetch a higher price, but the fees are considerable, I'm sure. If it helps, the card is 80s basketball and looks uh, to be in great shape and conservatively anticipating a 6 or a 7 from BGS. So with a card like that, you have a lot of options, and it's really sort of dependent on what you want to get out of it, your own personal situation. You know, let's assume you have a, a Jordan rookie and a BGS 6. I mean, there's lots of different ways to sell it. If you, if you want to move it fast, you know, auction it. Uh, I would recommend auctioning it, sending it to one of the auction houses. Like you said, yeah, Greg Morris and Probstein, like you wrote, are both fine. You know, you could go with Heritage or Four Sharp Corners. You know, any of these are going to be perfectly reasonable options. They're all going to fetch reasonable prices. And for the most part, the fees are going to be fairly similar across the board. Some will be a little higher or lower than others. You can sort of shop around if that's uh, really significant to you. But uh, if you wanted to sell it yourself and try to milk a little bit more out of it, you could... Post it on eBay as a buy it now or best offer. You might be able to sell it for a little bit higher, but it'll it'll take a little longer to sell, and, and you might not be able to get higher for it, but at least you give yourself a chance to make a little more money. Um, if you didn't want to have to deal with shipping and stuff, you could use a vault service like a, a ComC or a PWCC or Golden or the eBay vault. Any of these vaults will sort of do all that work for you. Um, and again, you can set your own asking price, see if you get lucky, you know, sell it a little higher than you would otherwise in an auction. But that's sort of all up for uh, for you to decide. You know how much time and effort you want to put into it versus just uh, moving it quickly and, and getting you know as close to as close to top dollar as you can. Low roller scratcher asked if they pay you friends and family in PayPal, is it tax free or do you still have to report it to the IRS? A, uh, a guy you paid him fifteen hundred dollars on your recent video, does he have to pay taxes on that? So to be perfectly honest, you know I don't know. I uh, I personally report everything to the IRS, so all my sales, all my expenses. You know whether it's uh, PayPal or cash or credit card or check. I just I just report it all just to avo you know avoid any issues. And um, I, I actually really don't know what the law says in terms of someone re receiving just like a you know a single PayPal payment. 
Tatis Trader 2103 wrote, I'd love to hunt for collections and eventually build up enough customers so the cards come to me. What are some methods to find collections in person early on prior to creating referrals and connections? Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, estate sales. I'm in the process of opening a hobby shop and currently looking for ways to build inventory outside of your standard hobby marketplace and shows. Ah, very cool. You know, good luck opening the uh, the store. So early on when you're trying to find deals and cards and collections, it's, it's really tough. It's it's a... Uh, it's really a hustle and um yeah you're on the right track i mean craigslist i don't know if that's any good anymore it used to be pretty good but uh, i would imagine it's kind of gone down facebook marketplace is probably a good spot uh definitely estate sales you, you know you'll swing and miss quite a lot at estate sales because a lot of times they'll just be you know 280s commons and but but and they won't they won't know that that's not worth anything so you have to go out there and look and then turn out to be but estate sales once in a while you'll you'll hit some nice stuff and what's really important about estate sales and those sort of things is if you ever do find an estate sale with some nice cards, uh, let the estate sale company know that you're a buyer of sports cards. And next time, if they run across a, a you know, they run across a, an estate with a bunch of cards, they might just call you directly, and you can just come buy them. And you know, it's win-win for them. They don't want to deal with it, and you might, you know, get a nice collection here and there. But really important to just get your name out there. There's really a good thing to do at, at card shows too. Go to card shows, go up to dealers, let them know that you're a buyer, and let them know what you're buying specifically and uh, give them a reason to believe that you, you pay strong. And, you know, it's af actually often good to go to dealers that deal in things other than what you want to buy. So if you want to buy modern, you know, go up to a vintage dealer and say, hey, if you ever buy a collection and uh, there's a bunch of, the bunch of you know, vintage in there for you and there's a bunch of modern sitting over here that you don't know what to do with, give me a call. I'll just come buy it all in one swoop. You don't have to deal with it. And uh, most important is just sort of get your name out there as much as you can. And that sort of helps get the, the snowball rolling down the hill a little faster. Jeffco wrote, with all the different releases and print runs, how do you see cards holding value in the future, such as Julio Rodriguez having like 500 different rookie cards? Yeah, so I've talked about this a few times, and you know, yeah, I just think that these sort of cards are just really going to struggle to go up in value long term or, or hold their value long term. Uh, there's just so many of them, so much supply, so many different you know br cards and brands and copies and I mean, it might feel like a lot of them are rare, like you have a card numbered out of 50, but he's got a thousand other cards numbered out of 50, and they're all sort of interchangeable with each other in terms of collector interest. Like, for the most part, most collectors wouldn't care if they have this one numbered out of 50 or this one numbered out of 50. They're basically the same thing, and so it feels like they might be rare, but when you add it all up, it, it, they're really not. And, and on top of that, the prices are so high out of the gate. I mean, prospect cards have always been kind of overvalued, but... Today, it's to, to an extreme level where it's baked into the prices that these players are going to be all-time great. So they have to be an all-time great just to hold their value, right? If they become sort of a, a very, very good, the cards are going to drop significantly long-term. So I think I think that's probably the fate of most of the ultra-modern stuff, of ultra-modern rookies in the last you know couple of years, unfortunately, long-term. Now, I, I do think there are exceptions like Topps Chrome, Gold Refractor, you know, Auto, PSA 10. I think that sort of stuff... Uh, you know, if the player does sort of pan out, that sort of stuff will will could work out nicely, like the cream of the cream of the crop. But the vast majority, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think will will do very well long term. Next one sent by Stephen wrote, not really sure how to phrase this, but what do you know about eBay's algorithms and what's being shown when someone searches? The reason I ask is that for the last couple of years I've been selling, it seems like my items take forever to sell or even get views. And meanwhile, the same item shows up in a recent sale for higher prices. It's frustrating to say the least. Are those fake bids by sellers to pump up the prices? Or are people really just clicking on the top listing without spending two seconds to sort by price? Example, I have a 2021 Topps Chrome Ben Baller Hobby Box for sale. About 220 shipped included. Uh, sure, it's not the lowest on eBay, but I'm, I'm showing some recent sales for higher than that. This applies to just about anything I sell on eBay, and it's not like they're all being sold by major players with loyal followers. There's are small-time sellers like me with low feedback numbers or with under 300. My item, uh, item listings and descriptions are accurate and thorough. The only way I end up selling is by eventually accepting an offer that is the lowest sold price in recent history, and, and, and even that can take months. Even weeks after it's sold, I see several more uh, for much higher sold prices. What am I doing wrong? Are my listings hidden? Look forward to your thoughts. So I really know very little about the eBay algorithm other than it heavily favors sellers with a lot of feedback or and, and very, very strong feedback. Uh, which it should. I mean, that sort of creates a better environment for, for buyers overall in general. But it is a disadvantage to newer sellers, uh, but you sort of have to sort of earn your way into the algorithm's favor, you know, if, if you will. But, you know, I don't know the specifics of your store, how much feedback you have, how long you've been doing it, how strong your feedback is. But 
what I would say in a very, very general sense is, is what you're describing is not unusual. Like, uh, you know, selling cards on eBay is not easy. Often cards will sit in there for a long time, even if they're priced fair, you know, priced competitively. Uh, stuff will often just sit for months at a time. This is one of the reasons why it's so hard to buy collections, break them up, and sell the things individually because it can take so long for stuff to sell at times. And especially if it's an item where buyers have a lot of options, a lot of places to go. Like the, the, the Chrome box you're, you're describing, you know, buyers can go to stores and buy that. They can go to shows to buy that. They can buy that in numerous places online. There's probably, I don't know, many available on eBay at any individual time. So that's not something that's going to just fly off the shelf because there's a lot, just a lot of competition. Um, now, you know, again, your specific situation, I can't really speak to why you're seeing a couple of sales higher than yours priced at, that, you know, that, that, that is a little strange, but just in a general sense, what, what you're describing, I would say is not unusual. This was sent in by Zach who wrote, since vintage cards seem to be holding a better value than modern cards, do you think like the vintage common cards of non-star players from the 60s and 70s will eventually be worth at minimum $5 each and more? I know that condition plays a factor, but I was wondering if those vintage cards will have a minimum value of at least $5 each and up. I just can't believe that some vintage common cards from the 70s are only worth $0.10, cents, $0.25, cents, etc. So I actually don't. I mean, it's an interesting thought, but you know, one of the reasons I like dealing in vintage is a lot of vintage cards, commons and, and, and lower end stars and stuff, this stuff just doesn't fluctuate in value basically at all. I mean, in, in the past, in short term or the long term, I mean, the value of a 70s common is essentially the same as it was 20 years ago, you know, most 70s commons are 5 cents, 10 cents, you know, 25 cents type of thing. Um, and same with 60s commons, you know, most 60s commons in sort of mid grade are like 50 cents, a dollar, maybe up to two dollars, but basically the same that they were 20 years ago or, or whatever you want to say. And it's just been very, very flat for a very long time. And I would just ex expect that trend to continue. Uh, I don't I don't see, you know, a reason for it not to, you know, neither side of the supply or demand equation I, I see changing much in, in any sort of way. Supply wise, you know, there's there's a lot of it out. I mean, not a lot. There's there's plenty of it out there. I don't really see the supply side changing. Like there's not going to all of a sudden dry up a bunch of 60s comms or something. And demand wise, you know, I don't know why the demand would change. You know, there's a lot of collectors or always has been. I don't see a reason why there won't continue to be so. Uh, you know, it's been flat for a very long time, and I would I would expect that that trend to continue into the into the future. Purple Rain Sports Cards wrote, "What current day active players would you invest in before the next baseball season?" So I'm definitely the wrong person to ask about this. I, I don't try to predict who's going to have a good season. I was never good at doing that in the past. I will at times, you know, try to predict players who I think are a little undervalued and hope that you know years down the road if their career trajectory continues their their card values will be worth a lot more like i did this with arenado and uh, manny machado that sort of worked out i did it with giancarlo stanton that did not work out so sort of hit or miss but uh, i don't really try to predict like in an upcoming season who's going to be good i think that's like a total total crap shoot uh what i will do sometimes is uh buy during the off season like for baseball you'd want to buy in like november basically or a football you want to buy in like March or April when when like nobody's thinking about the sport and 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 focus on auctions you you can often get like really cards really cheap in auction at, in those times and then just hold on to them till the start of the season and sell during right at the beginning of the season basically before the season started because when the season once the season starts actually more players go down in value because they're not off to killer starts so when there's just a bunch of hype about the upcoming season sell then um, this doesn't always work out because there's a lot of market factors, but sometimes it, it, it can it can work. And, and, you know, I wouldn't focus on like a single player. I would sort of buy like a cross section of all the major stars in the game. So if I was doing baseball, you know, pick 10 major stars, I would I would not focus on prospects, but younger stars, uh, maybe, you know, buy one each of their rookie cards during the offseason and then sell right at the beginning of the season. This isn't something I do very often, but I've, I've done it a couple of times and, yeah, it's, it, you know, reasonable, reasonably successfully. Improving the world asked in 50 years will kids think cards from the tw uh, from 2000 to 2020 era are vintage driving prices through the roof. Oh uh, yeah, I mean I guess anything that's 50 years old, you know, would be considered vintage, right? We consider stuff from the 70s and back to be vintage today. Uh but in terms of like driving prices through the roof, I don't, you know, I don't know that I would predict that. I mean, I guess it could happen, anything could happen, but I, I probably wouldn't guess that. I mean, we can go back 40 years today into the 80s and you know, cards from the 80s generally have very very little value today. I mean, uh, you know, top rookies in PSA 10, that stuff can be worth a lot, but the vast, vast majority of cards from the 80s have little to no value, and that's simply because of the supply side of the equation. Too much supply, way too much of it out there uh, for stuff to go up in value, really. 
and there's been a lot of supply of cards throughout you know throughout the last number of decades so i don't i don't think that you know the majority of cards will sort of go way up in value uh over over time here you know i think the cream of the crop of the top tier players that stuff can go up nicely but uh you know bulk wise i don't i don't think like cards in general are all going to go way up in value because people you know view them as vintage down the road Brad asked, uh, how do you find the best way to list lots on eBay? By team, player, players, same year, different year, etc. Looking for a better way to boost my lot sales. So it really depends on your inventory, what, what you're talking about, what years you're talking about. So a tough one for me to sort of answer. In, in very general terms, you know, with vintage lots, I, tr I tend to try to uh, group everything by condition. That's very important. And if, you know, think in terms of a buyer, like if you can make a starter set so there's no duplicates, you know, it's a lot of extra work. But if, if you can, that, that, that helps a lot. Um, but most important for vintage, I'd say, is condition. People like to buy uniform conditions when they're putting sets together. They don't want, like, you know, a mix of mid-grade, low-grade, high-grade stuff all in one lot. Uh, so condition is very important for vintage. For modern, I mean, again, it really depends on your inventory. I tend to make my modern lots by player. I find a lot of player, people like to collect player and, you know, by player. They have a favorite player. They'd love to buy a 10-count lot, a 20-count lot, a 100-count lot, a 500-count lot of Mark McGuire or Ronald Acuna or whoever whoever it is. So that's one one thing I do, but th there's lots of different ways to, to do it. Next one sent by David Thompson. Wrote, With all the BS going on recently at Beckett's grading service, uh, Jeff C. getting 22 of 27 cards submitted uh, black label 10s and a string of 134 cards with 9s or 10s, how can you justify using Beckett's services as an objective grader of cards? So I'm not actually familiar with uh, that story. I don't, I don't know the, the Jeff C. thing or any of the details behind that, but you know, I, I personally don't really use Beckett, I, not because I have a problem with Beckett or anything. I just, they're not the right company for what, what I'm looking to do. But, you know, what I would say is if, if you have a problem with a company, you know, you don't like something they've done, any any company, then just, just don't use them. Don't buy their, don't use their service, don't buy their product. And, and that's the, the free market speaking. The Boring Channel asked, what is your opinion on Japanese baseball cards of Sadahara O as a potential investment? Seems undervalued compared to their scarcity. So I don't I don't know that I would target him specifically really just because there's not really any date not, not much data on it like finding sale sales of you know sales data on his cards over time there's just very very little of it so it's a hard one to sort of you know guess what's going to happen in the future you know I guess I guess I would say he's a name he's a very very significant name he probably doesn't have a lot of cards if you're looking at sort of like one of his higher grade more significant cards I don't even know what his notable cards are they're so niche, but if you if you're sort of targeting his most notable cards in higher grade, I would I would guess that those are gonna probably do well long term. Next question is from Walker. Wrote my question is please explain why the new cards are valued so much higher than premium junk wax. New rookie cards for average players go for three to four times what Hall of Fame rookie go cards go for. As someone who works in finance and understands supply demand, I get the junk wax era was overproduced. But correct me if I'm wrong. It seems the hobby is overproducing again. And and just saying. It's a new variation. For instance, you pull a 101 pink Wander Franco, and there's another 101 orange Wander Franco in the next box. I guess technically it is a 101, but they all uh, all they're doing is flooding the market with uh, supply with 101 cards. After opening a thousand dollars in new packs and pulling fifty dollars in cards, I've decided I'm just going to buy the cards that I want. I'm just a collector, so not looking to profit. So whenever you're doing like an apples to apples comparison of cards from two different eras, you know, two two cards with very similar quality cards, let's say. The cards of the active players are always, always going to be worth more. That, that's always been the case, and it probably always will be the case. And that's simply because just a lot of collectors want to want to want to collect cards of active players. They want to be able to follow their career, and you know, oh, he had a great season. He had a, he had a great game. That's a lot more exciting for a lot of people than collecting a retired person who's not in the limelight and there's there's nothing to sort of follow on a day to day basis. So even though the supply from cards from let's say the '80s, you know, you could say is roughly the same as it is today the demand is just a lot higher for the active players. So apples to apples, a card of an active player is going to be going to be worth more, you know, basically every single time. Uh, regarding the, the 101 thing you mentioned, yeah, you're, you're spot on. I think there's the fact that there's so many 101s, just different color parallel 101s of so many different cards, I think that's going to be a problem long term for the hobby in terms of those sort of things holding their value. And your last question, you basically answered yourself. You know, I opened $1,000 in packs, pulled $50 worth of cards. You know, this is exactly why I tell people to, to target singles collectors. You can just get so much more value for your dollar targeting singles. You can get exactly who you want, player, your favorite players. You can collect exactly what you want, you know, target exactly your favorite players, cards, teams, whatever. Whereas if you're opening packs, you're basically just getting a whole bunch of cards that are not worth anything near what you paid and, and you probably don't even really want anyway.
Next one sent in by Corey, who wrote, When I buy lots, I pull the stars, even if they are considered commons, and hold on to them. I'm now sitting at something like 50,000 Hall of Fame star cards that are all worth a nickel to a quarter each, and I want to move them. Most are junk wax era, but some are early 80s, late 90s, or modern. What is your best advice to sell and maximize uh, these uh, your sales? Player lots, Hall of Fame lots, etc. So that's really hard stuff to move, but yeah, I'd probably do what you suggest, make make lots for eBay and, and probably buy player. Um, if you have if you have fifty thousand cards, you you probably have a lot of each player, and you can make some really really nice large lots. And uh, they're not going to fly off the shelf, but you'll definitely you'll, you'll at some point find you know a George Brett collector and a Robin Yount collector and a Ryan Sandberg collector and an Andre Dawson collector, whoever you have who will, who would love to buy like a, a large you know bulk lot of their favorite player and and, and play with it that way. And, uh, if they're priced reasonably, they'll they'll eventually sell. John wrote, with the long decline in sports cards pricing over the past year and change, has this cut into your margins with buying and selling cards, or have uh, the less wild price swings been easier to deal with? So that's a really good question. You know, the way I operate, it's, I'm not really impacted so much by whether the hobby is, is growing or declining at the moment. Um, I sort of operate in the same way, and my margins stay basically the same. You know, I deal, I deal a lot in vintage. Vintage just doesn't see these real price swings day to day much and and I, and I try to sell through things pretty quick like when I buy a collection I try to break it up and sell it really fast and try to sort of just you know I'm not I don't want to play the market I'm not playing the market I'm just trying to trying to do my thing and you know I, I'll hold cards here and there which I think are undervalued and have good chance of going up in the future but for the most part I, I, I don't hold a lot of cards I'm trying to buy them break it up and sell them fairly fairly quickly um, so I would say my margins, it, my margins haven't been impacted much in the last year and a half. What has has been an impact in the last year and a half is a lot of collections I go to buy, people are overvaluing their collections because cards values have been on the decline for a while. So a lot of people are, you know, they bought their cards a year ago and now their cards are just worth a whole lot less. And, you know, when I go to tell them what I can pay, they're, they're surprised by how, how little that is. Uh, so I've been seeing a, a lot more of that in the last year than before, but... Uh, beyond that, uh, I would say, yeah, not, not a whole lot of impact to the way I operate. Sport Card Finds asked, I was recently thinking about the long-term value of modern on-card autos versus sticker autos. To know that a player actually signed each individual card makes it a lot more special to me. There is a difference in price already, but with all the parallels getting more and more unattractive, it leaves me thinking the on-card variants are one of the best ways to go in terms of collectability in the future. Also, finding actual game-worn match, uh, patches in modern products, especially football, becomes very rare. What is your point of view on this matter? Uh, yeah, I basically agree. I mean, I much prefer on-card autos to sticker autos. I think they just look better, and there's something very, very cool to know that the, the player actually held that card in their hand when they signed it or had it in their possession when they signed it as opposed to just, you know, a, a, an employee over at Panini took a sticker off and then put it onto the card. Um, so, yeah, I, and I think we've already sort of seen that. Like, when, when sticker autos first appeared on the hobby, I don't think people really differentiated in terms of value between a sticker auto and an on-card auto, I think they were basically worth the same. And over time, they've slowly, you know, the sticker autos, uh, sorry, the on-card autos have slowly become more more in demand and more valuable. And I would guess that trend will continue into the future. And even more so with the patch card stuff. I mean, uh, I, I think it's really cool to know that the, the cloth, you know, on the card was worn by a player in a specific major league game on this date, whatever, as opposed to, oh, this might have been worn by some guy, maybe who knows one day, I don't remember. And I think over time that'll become, I don't know, maybe I wouldn't even predict that, but I would sort of hope that over time that would become more more relevant to, you know, collectors. Next question is from M. Beer, who wrote, I have a question about my 1971 tops, Nolan Ryan. Mainly, why would the original owner submit for an authentic versus a grade? Minus the centering, the eye appeal is pretty great, especially for a 71. I'm guessing it's trimmed. Uh, so I couldn't find a picture of, uh, that you, you sent to the card, but for a, a 1971 Ryan, there's a, a number of reasons someone might want it. Uh, it might be great authentic as opposed to have a number grade. Uh, trimmed is certainly an op a possibility. With the 1971s, the, the, with the black borders, those often ha are recolored, meaning like one of the corners or something has shows a little bit of white chipping, and someone will take a black marker and recolor them. That's very, very common on the 71s. That, that, that could be it. So that's considered recolored and, and won't get a number grade. It can only be considered authentic. Uh, or, you know, if, if sometimes a, someone's submitting a card and they just think a card's going to be a really low grade, they'd rather just have it be authentic than a 2 or something like that. They, they can just choose that. But, you know, there, there's actually a lot of reasons why someone might, might, might pick that. Michael asked, what advice or personal strategies do you use or recommend when it comes to trying to sell for a profit while struggling with the nostalgic, sentimental feelings getting in the way. 
Uh, what are your goals for 2022, uh, 2023 YouTube and for the year in general? And if you were able to restart your channel from day one, would there be anything you would have done differently or told yourself something that you know now? So with the nostalgic thing, it's really not something I struggle with anymore. It was really, really hard when I first became a dealer, but it's just something you, you just have to push through. You, you just can't, you know, you, you, can't, you can't get high on your own stash as they say. You got, you got to separate that. Today, I really don't struggle with it anymore, not because I'm not nostalgic about the cards or because I don't love, I mean, I, I, I love cards more than I ever have, but I've just had so many cards come in and out of my possession that I, I no longer feel like, oh, you know, I'll never, own, you know, I just always feel like, oh, I'll, I'll probably own this card again, or I can go buy it later if I want. Um, and I just sort of have that mentality. If I, if I ever own a card, you know, come into possession of a card that's truly rare, you know, and this is truly a good chance the only time I'll ever own it, and I I really, really like it for whatever reason. Well, then I'll just keep it, so I don't, I don't have to, to worry about that so much. But um, yeah, in the beginning it was tough, and, and it was is something you really, really have to just force yourself to to push through. Uh, goals for twenty twenty three YouTube. Well, I, I mean, I'd love the channel to grow. You know, I, I my sense is that my channel is sort of maxed out in terms of uh, sports card. You know, people in the sports card world who would be interested in my channel. There are certainly channels bigger than mine, but I, you know the way I present my videos, I don't know that there's a, a lot more audience out there to capture. So you know, one thought I was thinking was try to expand into uh, more general things like like sports content, but in, incorporate cards into it, but have it be like, like like I did a couple of Hall of Fame videos. You know, talk about the Baseball Hall of Fame, and then sort of on the side mention cards and sort of try to draw viewers in uh, that way. You know, more like baseball fans as opposed to baseball card fans. Obviously, there's a lot more baseball fans out there than baseball card fans. So, and that also might sort of bring in some baseball fans and you know introduce them to the hobby a little bit on the side, and, and that might benefit the hobby and grow the channel. So that was one idea for 2023. Able to restart your channel from day one? Anything you would have done differently? Uh, I'm sure. Yeah, there's probably a lot of things I would have done. So the first thing that comes to mind is uh, I spent way too much time at the beginning planning stuff like. I was planning out my early videos, like writing, I was scripting them out and spending so much time, you know, perfecting them and reshooting things and, you know, making sure I didn't make any mistakes. And, you know, I just, I just wasted a lot of time. The, the truth is the first 50 videos I made, nobody watched them. I mean, they, they got, you know, 10 views, 20 views, 50 views. Half of them were my, my, my mom and my sister and my wife and nobody was watching them. It, it was just a really, really slow, steady growth at the beginning. And I, I spent way too much time perfecting them. Like I think I think I should have just put out a video, you know, then put out my second video, make trying to make it one percent better, then put out my third video, trying to make it one percent better, then make it on my fourth video, just learn as I go, get better as I go, and this would have been a much better strategy and and, and uh, probably than than the way I tried to do it. And Michael asked, uh, I was wondering if you were to start up a second channel, non sports, what would it be about? So for a while I was I was considering like you know, second channels. It's, it's really not on my radar at the moment. Um, if I did one, it would, it would probably be sports related, but if you, you made me pick one that's not sports related, it would, I mean, it'd probably be like star Wars. Yeah. I'm not, a, you know, I'm a big star Wars fan, but I'm not like an expert in the way I am with cards. So I don't know that I could just off the bat, make like a, a successful star Wars channel. Um, yeah, my, my son's really, really into chess. I'm sort of getting into chess a little bit just, to, just to support him. And so, yeah, maybe, maybe that, but um, yeah, uh, other channels at the moment is not, not really on my radar. But that's it. Thank you, everyone, for submitting all the great questions. Really appreciate it. And as always, if uh, anyone has any follow-up questions of any kind, feel free to leave them in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them. Eat your vegetables. Be good. Uh, may the force be with you, and see you again real soon. Thanks, everyone.